We are continuing in our study from the Book of Psalms once in a while. And um, the last time we studied Psalm 8, and um, we were deeply impressed by the psalmist's praises unto God. I think Psalm 8 was a really uh, beautiful psalm. <clears throat> As you probably remember, the first and the last verses, Psalm 8, are exactly the same um, wording, in fact, in exactly the same wording by saying, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Then, right after then, what do we expect after such an, a, a magnificent proclamation of the glory of God? And we will read Psalm 9, verse 1, right after Psalm 8. So Psalm 9, 1, which says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with all my, my whole heart, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Though it is hard to make a simple outline for the book of Psalms, we probably must agree that these Psalms are well arranged in such a way that there is a natural flow of thoughts, at least between Psalms 8 and 9. And also, if we look at Psalm 7 and Psalm 9, separated by Psalm 8, we will be even more impressed. The last verse of Psalm 7, which is verse 17, says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Having said the praises unto the Lord in Psalm 7, the psalmist praised the glorious name of the Lord in Psalm 8. And then in Psalm 9, verse 2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. So if you compare Psalm 7, 17, last verse from Psalm 7, and Psalm 9, 2, you cannot but see the similarities between them. The title of Psalm 9 is difficult to understand. It says to the chief musician upon Muthlaben, a Psalm of David. It tells us that its author is David, and it was to be performed under the guidance of the chief musician. So far, we do not have any, any trouble. However, the meaning of Muthlaben has been very much controversial. Let me give you an example. The ESV and um, the NASB say Muthlaben, as the King James Bible says. It is not a translation. You do not know what it means it is not a translation, but transliteration, which is written as the Hebrew word is pronounced. The NIV reads it as the death of the sun. Interestingly, both ESV and the NASB have a marginal note saying probably musical or liturgical term and death to the sun. Because of that, some commentators are saying that maybe the title should be the death to the sun, death of the sun, Epsilon. But that is too much imagination and conjecture. The Septuagint reads it as the secret of the sun. Some rabbis read it as the death of Nabal. More than 100 years ago, some you know, commentators um, revived this idea. However, however, there are too many conjectures and imaginations, and we um, remove all those things. Though it is not very clear, it probably refers to musical direction, either to sing the psalm according to the melody of a song by their name, or to render it after the manner of this hymn. Though some suggest that this word might be some kind of reference to, you know, the death of Absalom, as I said before, um, that is uh, too much um, conject conjecture to follow. Naturally, it is not in our position to determine exactly into which time of David's life the contents of this psalm falls. It is well known that David had to undergo many years of hard fightings before he decisively overcame his many external foes. Besides, as verse 11, Psalm um, uh, 9 reminds us, this psalm must have been composed after the Ark of the Covenant had been brought up to Jerusalem. For the Lord, 
is being regarded as the one who dwelleth in Zion. From Psalm 9, we come to Psalm 10 to find a prayer made during the time of heavy pressures in the life. So let us consider about the composition of Psalms 9 and 10. There are some reasons why I'm putting these two Psalms together. In order to study Psalm 10, it is really necessary to at least skim through Psalm 9 because Psalms 9 and 10 are very interestingly and fascinatingly intertwined. First of all, let's see a few characteristics of both Psalms. Psalm 9 verses 1 to 12 praises the Lord for his mighty deliverance and verses 13 to 20 of the same psalm plead to the Lord for the continuation of this deliverance. Thus, it is a psalm of the combination of praise. The first half is a praise psalm. Thank you, Lord, for your deliver deliverance. And the second half of the psalm is a petition. Please continue to deliver us from those troubles. If we read the two psalms together, we can find many, many similarities. For example, in times of trouble, in 9.9 and 10.1 is a peculiar phrase found nowhere else. You can find in time of trouble in a few places, but in times of trouble, that expression, that phrase is found only in these two places. Chapter uh, Psalm 9, verse 9, and Psalm 10, verse 1. The word for oppressed is another example. And mortal men, Hebrew word enosh is used, not adam is used here, at the close of both Psalms in the same connection. So Psalm 9, 19, 20, and Psalm 10, verse 18. And there is another expression like forever and ever, and the word arise. And these are the similarities between these two Psalms. Psalm 9 is accredited to David, while Psalm 10 does not have it does not give us any clue about this author, so you cannot find any title for it. However, in general, David's authorship is believed. There are at least a couple of reasons why. First reason, these two psalms have lots of similarities. If these two psalms are placed side by side, and Psalm 9 is accredited to David, and both psalms have lots of similarities, it is not a totally wrong conclusion that um, David must have written both the Psalms. There is a feature of acrostic Psalms in these two Psalms. And I sent you an email with a brief definition of acrostic Psalm. Acrostic Psalms are distinctive in their poetic form in that a subsequent, though not always consecutive verses begin with a word whose first letter follows the order of the Hebrew alphabet. So oftentimes, either in the beginning or at the end of each um, verse, there is an alphabetic order you, you will be able to find. And uh, sometimes some letters may be omitted here and there. At other times, more than one verse opens with the same letter. However, yet the acrostic pattern is readily recognizable in these two Psalms, Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. By the way, in the book one, in the book of Psalms, there are three Psalms we may call as creation Psalms. And those Psalms are Psalm 8, Psalm 24, and Psalm 33. And coincidentally, all these Psalms precede acrostic Psalms. So interestingly, Psalm 8, precedes acrostic Psalms 9 and 10. Psalm 24 precedes acrostic Psalm 25. Psalm 33 precedes acrostic Psalm 34. And I do not know why the psalmist has arranged, um, the book of Psalm is arranged in that manner. I do not know. But uh, somehow there is such an arrangement and pattern. Psalms 9 and 10 are treated as a single psalm in the, in the Septuagint. The Masoretic Hebrew text, Hebrew text is being called as Masoretic text. And so Masoretic Hebrew text separates the two psalms while Greek Septuagint puts them together. 
a manuscript from Qumran with a proposed dating of AD 50 to 68 also attests to this separation by a blank line that precedes the first verse of Psalm 9. So there is a division between Psalm 9 and Psalm 10, but there is an absence of a title for Psalm 10. So it may support the original unity of the two Psalms as attested to by the Septuagint. It is important to revisit the issue of acrostic nature of Psalms um, a bit. Worth noting that um, uh, Psalm 10 opens with the next letter of the alphabetic acrostic after the first 11 letters had been covered in Psalm 9. So there is a continuation of alphabetic order between Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. And um, um, the finer verses of Psalm 10 also conclude with a clear echo of the substance of Psalm 9. And, and um, um, I'm just uh, skipping a few things here because there are too many technical things. Uh, things I prepared and I thought it may not be necessary for you. But I just want you to remember that there are continuity from Psalm 9 to Psalm 10. Psalm 9 gives us some ideas about why David made a continuing prayer in Psalm 10. Psalm 9 tells us of the, of the reality of the believers, of, uh, believer's life in this world. Psalm 9 begins with praises unto God and ends with the earnest pleas for deliverance. Therefore, it is pretty hard to know whether Psalm 9 is a psalm of praise or a psalm of a petition. Because the first part is praise God for his deliverance. And second part says, please, Lord, deliver us from all these things. Both elements of prayer are so blended into one another that it seems unwise to say it is either the one or the other. It is both. I hope that it encourages all of us rather than it discourages us. This encouragement comes from two sides of the reality of the believer's life. There are times of rejoicing. So we praise God and we give thanksgiving unto him. There are victories and deliverances. David says in Psalm 9, verses 3 and 4, that God has turned back the enemy and thereby upheld his cause. In verses 5 and 6, he says that God has overthrown the enemies. In verses 7 and 8, David declares that God ruled supreme as a judge, just a judge. In verses 9 and 10, thus the people of God are led to take refuge in him. In verses 11 and 12, God cannot but be praised because he has remembered his own people. So there are victories and deliverances. And at the same time, there are times, there are also times of making pleas in distress. David pleads the Lord to consider his troubles in verses 13 and 14. And there are remaining distresses he has to deal with. The nations, the heathen, are trying to use their own devices, but destined to be caught in their own devices in verses 15 and 16. The wicked shall perish and the needy shall not be forgotten in verses 17 and 18, which indicates that there are still active works of the wicked in David's life. In verses 19 and 20, David pleads God to judge the nations that they may know their frailty. These changing and mixed experiences of the believers are a part of ongoing conflicts between the godly and the ungodly. We can find this contrast by knowing about these two separate groups. There are different terms, different titles used for these two different groups. Number one, the ungodly are called mine enemies, nine three, heathen or the nations, and the wicked, enemy, the covetous, God's enemies, the evil men, and the men of earth. And so those titles are given to the ungodly. Then we we can see how God how the godly are mentioned in these two Psalms. These are the names or titles used for the godly. The people in uprightness, 
9.8. The oppressed, 9.9.10.18. Those who know the name of God, those who seek God, the humble, the needy, the poor, the innocent, the fatherless. These ongoing conflicts between the godly and the ungodly are the norm of the believer's spiritual journey. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It is totally against many believers' expectations. If we are godly, we must be blessed and enjoy the prosperity and success all the time. But that is completely a different idea against the scriptural um, suggestions and truth. Matthew 5, verses 10 and 12, 10 to 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all men are of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. You know, we, we love to hear praises from everybody. You know, we love to hear words from people that we are good people. But in fact, the ones who are striving to live a godly life is going to experience a totally different things like a persecution and reviles. The godly cannot but demonstrate their righteousness and Christ's honor in their lives and their values and worldviews cannot but clash with the counterparts of the ungodly. First Peter chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 say this, for, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So sometimes for the godly folks, God does allow them to go through a certain painful and suffering experiences so that they may be sanctified. They may walk in the will of God, not after the lusts of men. So far, we have seen the flow of the thoughts between Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. And now we are moving into Psalm 10 in particular. Here we can find a prayer with supplications. We would say that Psalm 10 is a supplicatory psalm. In this psalm, the personality of the psalmist keeps entirely in the background. Psalm 9 celebrates the defeat of the enemies which are heathen or nations. That is, they are foreign forces. In contrast, Psalm 10 deals with the apostates and persecutors who are David's own countrymen, though the heathen are mentioned in the latter part of the psalm. Psalm 10 opens with an inquiry in the first two verses, in particular verse 1. Why standest thou afar, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken into devices that they have imagined. It is a question about why the Lord tarries in the deliverance of his oppressed people. Sometimes some people tend to understand it as the psalmist complained. So David is just grumbling and David is complaining to God. But it is neither a complaining nor a murmuring at the delay that is expressed by the question. Instead, it is an ardent desire that God may not delay to act. As, um, um, so there is a the longing uh, expression in this question. God, please be with me. Please listen to me. It is a plea. Instead, it is really an ardent desire that God may not delay to act. There are two questions in verse 1. Why does God stand in distance in the present hopeless condition of affairs as an either spectator? Sometimes we do have those questions in our minds. Why does God cover his eyes so as not to see the desperate condition of his people or also his ears? 
so as not to hear their supplication. The first accusation against the wicked is found in verse 2a. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. The word for persecute is translated as hotly pursue by the ESV and the, and the NASB, while the NIV says hunt down. And so it tells us of the grave situation that the psalmist fell into. He's being hotly pursued. He's being hunted down. It's another lexical definition is to burn, which is used by the Septuagint translators. It must be used in reference to the heat of feeling under oppression, which is the result of the persecution of the ungodly. The ungodly are wicked. And they are guilty of crime, of hostil hostility to God or his people, and of sin. The wicked do evil things in their pride. They are haughty and exalt themselves to high. The first supplication against the wicked is found in verse 2b. So accusation is made. They are hotly pursuing the godly people. And so first the supplication against the wicked is found to be, let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. If we read it as it is, it sounds like that the psalmist is praying to the Lord that he should let the wicked ones be caught by their own craft, crafty devices. So whatever crafty devices they made, by them, with them, they may be caught Thus, whatever they devised must be used against them. So let me give you examples from other translations. The ESV says, let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. So both plural words are used. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. The NASB says, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. It's almost the same thing. The NIV says, who are caught in the schemes he devises. Here is an interesting uh, change. Who are caught, which means plotter. Then the second one, in the schemes he devises, that is a singular. So all other translations are using plotter forms uh, for two, either verb or uh, nouns. But NA, NA, uh, NIV uses one plural and one singular. So when I find such a thing, my eyes are lighting up. What, what's the problem here? Well, I received an impression that the King James, the ESV, and NASB all take the wicked as the subject. So wicked ones, a plural. Thus it says, the wicked in their pride, or wicked if it is, it has to be a singular, in his pride, doth persecute the poor, let them be taken in devices they have imagined. The wicked who made the devices should be taken by them. Thus, these are translations should be read as the ones who devise the schemes, who are inevitably the wicked people, should be caught in their own plots. In this prayer, the psalmist says about the evil activities of the wicked in verse 2a, then now he makes a plea to God to let them perish with their own devices. And on the other hand, there are other commentators like Lupert and Delich, both are very famous and reputable Old Testament scholars who assign two different subjects to two different verbs. If we read verse 2 carefully, there are two classes of people. One, the wicked. The other one, the poor. Thus, these commentators assign the poor with the first verb and the wicked with the second verb. Thus, it becomes the poor are caught in the devices that the wicked have devised. So the ones who are caught by those wicked, crafty devices are the poor ones, not the ones who made, who devised those things. So it seems that there are different meanings uh, expressed here. Probably the NIV prefers this translation to the other. 
In this way, the psalmist brings a continuing accusation against the wicked people in this verse. And uh, frankly speaking, really, I cannot say um, that um, both are wrong or one of them is wrong. I think either way it can go. However, however, though it is not easy to determine which one may be correct, I would incline obviously to keep keep the King James translation because the first word of the next verse, verse three, begins with the word for, F-O-R, or because. Having accused the wicked to the Lord for their evil pursuit after the poor in the first part of verse two, in the second part of verse 2, he prayed to God to let the wicked be taken by their own devices. Then in verse 3, he begins to explain the reason why he made such a plea. So I think within the context, that makes a perfect flow. The same prayer is made in Psalm 9, 15, and 16. You will find quite similar prayer from Psalm 9, 15, and 16. So he's praying to God that he will let those wicked ones to fall into their own wicked devices. The psalmist lists the sinfulness of the wicked in verses 3 to 11. The wicked boasts of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous in verse 3. The wicked does not seek after God, verse 4. The ways of the wicked are always grievous, verse 5a. The wicked does not care about God's judgment, judgments in verse 5b. The wicked have a false confidence that he would not fall into adversity, verse 6. The wicked has an evil tongue producing evil speeches, in verse 7. The wicked makes evil plot to harm the innocent, verse 8a. The wicked hurts the poor, verse 8b to 9. The wicked disguises himself as if he's humble, verse 10. The wicked deceives himself that God does not see his evil doings, verse 11. Let me explain to you about the wicked in this psalm, having given you all those lists. Just a few things, I can put them together. The wicked is, first of all, shameless people. They just do not know what shame is about. They have such stony faces. Verse 3 says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The Hebrew word for boast here is Hillel, and it comes from Hallel, which means to praise. Hallelujah is coming from this. Hallelujah comes from the same root word. The wicked ones are not just endorsing the covetous, but praising the person. Far from hiding the shameful desire or passion of his soul, he makes it an object and ground of a high and sounding praise, imagining himself to be above all restraint to human or divine. As Delich says, the object of their praises is none other than the covetous. They are praising the covetous ones, the greedy ones, in comparison with the uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 to maybe 13 or 14. Here, um, uh, Proverbs 1, verse 10. And let me read it, just a few verses here. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and the hole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall feed our houses with the spoil. That's greedy and covetous. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse, my son. Walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Well, how different the biblical instruction from the wicked people, ungodly uh, way of life. In contrary, the wicked blesses the covetous. 
Hence, we learn that even the ability to feel shame, I think, is a grace. When we are able to be ashamed of our wrongs, we cannot but praise God because that is the grace of God. God convicts us of our wrongs. When we do not feel shames, though we have done shameful things, we are in darkness of mind. The wicked is haughty in verse 4. The whole texture of his thoughts proceeds from and tends towards the thought that there is no God at all. Thus, he goes about his sins as though they, there were no God. Or we would say that he knows that there is God, but despises him. The wicked ones relies on false security. His ways are always grievous. The Hebrew word for grievous literally means to prosper. The ESV and NASB say his ways prosper at all times. And the NIV says his ways are always prosperous. The wicked confidently behaves because for a while every course he follows turns out successfully. And I think it is not just related to uh, to the ungodly and wicked, unconverted, and sinners and wicked people, evil ones. But oftentimes, I think it is also found in the lives, in the hearts of many professing believers. I would say that they are theistic atheists. They profess Jesus as their Lord, but as long as they enjoy the success, as long as they do not have any problems, they do not recognize their sin as sin. Wrong as wrong. Right and wrong depends on success and prosperity, which is a wrong way to measure our morality and our justice and righteousness. So I would say that that is really a, a theistic atheist. They believe in God, but they live as if there is no God because they are enjoying temporary success. Temporary prosperity. I am not sick. My business goes well. My children are prosperous. And whatever I try to do, they are successful. Therefore, I and I do not have any issues with God. Well, probably that may not be the case. Even the wicked can confidently say that there is no problem. Even there is no God because I am prosperous. Whatever ways he chooses, somehow, always he's led to the desired end. Obviously, these people's prosperity perplexes the suffering righteous. And that's why we find um, the question in verse 1. Why standest thou afar, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Because righteous people's trouble time are the prosperous time of the wicked people. The wicked does not fear the judgment of God in verse 5b. The judgments of God are removed high as the heavens out of his sight and thus do not disturb his conscience. The wicked does not fear of any, including his adversaries. He puffeth them at them. The word puffeth is translated as either snort or sneer. The word may, to, may mean to blow away or blow down. Thus the wicked blows upon his enemies disdainfully. It does not mean that he drives his enemies away without much difficulties, but that by his pride and haughty bearing, he gives them to understand how little they interfere with him. The wicked gives a free course to the wicked tongue. So whatever they want to say, they say it. He speaks to his own heart in godless self-confidence. He believes that his success must go on forever. I shall not be moved even to that extent he is self-confident. 
It makes a contrast with the godly man's profession in Psalm 16 and Psalm 36. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The godly man can, can say that I shall not be moved because he trusts in God. In the like manner, the ungodly also says the same thing because he has confidence in himself. He does not believe that he will ever suffer with adversities. There is no recognition of his wickedness. It is truly a good example of really positive thinking. In fact, in reality, he is in trouble before God. But in his positive thinking, he will say, I am confident enough to say, I shall not be moved. He speaks out ungodly words, including cursing, deceit, fraud. Cursing, deceit, or craft of every kind. And fraud, which refers to violence, here are found in his words. Paul used this expression to describe the corruptness of the mankind in Romans 3.14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. I thought the word bitterness is interesting. Not only cursing. Believers may not speak the words of cursing. I hope not. But oftentimes they spit out the words of bitterness. How many Christians are ruining their spiritual tranquility and peace because of the bitterness of their hearts. And um, from their hearts, they are pouring out the words of a bitterness. And um, the wicked one is ready to lash out wickedness to others with his tongue. There are mischief and vanity under his tongue. Mischief and vanity could be understood as toil and the trouble. And I would like to relate it also to the believers too, because there are a lot of believers who are hurting others with their speeches, the way of their talks. They may simply say that, you know, I want to be really honest. That's why I need to pour out my feelings with all these words. Well, um, that person may feel that he or she has a right to say those things. But those hearers also do have, have rights and privileges not to hear those words. Words are showing maturity and character. And we have to understand that truly our tongue could be a source of all kinds of evilness. And um, the wicked make even opportunities to harm other people. Verses 8 to 10. He waits for opportunities to harm. Like a highwayman, he bides his time in ambush. Waylaying innocent men. He chooses the onward, onward um, villages where men are relatively less able to be defend, defended. There he slays innocent men in his hiding places where he is comparatively safe from detection. There he spies out others that may also be overcome by violence. He's like a lion who lurks in his thicket. Cowardly as he is, though likened to a lion, he singles out the poor as his victims, such as a few resources for their defense. He's like a hunter who catches his victim by drawing him into his net. He falls upon his victims as a lion, crouches, and lowers himself in disguise. Crouching down as low as possible, he lies on the watch. And the feeble and defenseless fall into his strong ones or strong paws. The wicked does what he thinks. He thinks that God has forgotten. He thinks that God has hidden his face, which means that God does not concern himself about these poor creatures and does not wish to know anything about them. In this way, they deny the truth of God. He thinks that God does not see his wrongs. He deceives himself and his thoughts are an absolute absurdity. He fabricates his own God 
for peace of mind. Sometimes I have kind of questions in my mind about a certain ways of thinking or Christian life or convictions of some professing believers have. Because clearly what they think and what they believe and what they are convinced about is not really biblical, but they are so strongly convinced by all their, those things. And what I can say is that a man has a capacity to fabricate, fabricate his own image of God according to his own ideas. Let me give you an example, but in, a, in a logical manner. How do we know God? And what is the Bible? If you, if you take any systematic theology lesson, you will hear such a statement that Bible is God's own revelation because man is not able to come to God and know him fully. That's why God has discloses. God has, God has revealed himself in the scriptures. Therefore, if anyone desires to know of God, of the Bible, that person must be able to glean the knowledge from the Bible. That is the first place we should go. But lots of Christians do not read the Bible. Most of the Christians do not have systematic and continuing study of the scriptures as a result. Not many Christians amongst us will say, I know the Bible but I believe in God. So here is, a, here is a dilemma. Here is a person who does not know the Bible. As a result, he really does not know about the, about the God of the Bible well enough, but he believes in God. As a result, what he thinks, what he behaves, what he uh, decides, decides or what he chooses, he feels that he must do after his own faith in God. The question is this. What kind of God this person is thinking about? This God is not definitely coming from the Bible because he, this person does not know the Bible. As a result, even though he claims the name of God, calls upon the name of God, his God is a God of his own ideas. Based on that, they have been, they have been convicted and convinced so they have a biblical or Christian conviction or spiritual insights, everything coming from the God of his own ideas. That is the way that we educate our children at home. Simply because we think that we are Christians, we can educate our children Christian way. That may not be so unless we are convinced by the Bible and we know the God of the Bible. We may have a fascinating capacity and ability to fabricate, fabricate our own God or gods for peace of mind. As long as we mention the name of God, we think that we are doing God-like, then may not be so. If God does not see or forgets sins of men, as the wicked people, then what is the difference between God and other gods or idols? What he gets out of these false ideas is that there is no punishment upon him. And at the same time, he is enjoying temporary peace, success, prosperity. So he denies a divine justice. I have done this, but God has not done anything to me. And also I am being prosperous. Well, so um, it seems that both the godly and the ungodly sometimes lament over the lack of justice and punishment over sinners in this world, but their motives and end results are different. And in verses 12 to 18, prayer of petitions. There are three petitions in verse 12, which are comprehensively explained in the subsequent verses. First, the psalmist pleads with the Lord to arise because he's being oppressed, he's being persecuted, 
he is being hotly pursued by the wicked people. So he says, God, arise, arise. It is because God is the God of justice. So he cannot but arise. In verse 15, he says, break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness thou, till thou find none. In other words, he's calling for the justice of God. Arise, God, show your justice. It is because God is the king. He's not just an obsolete being. But he's an absolute king. Verse 16 says, The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. It tells us about God's universal control of all things. God, you see everything. You know everything. You can do everything. Arise and do something about this, uh, these uh, situations. So he's pleading with the Lord to arise. Second, the psalmist pleads with the Lord to lift up his hand. The primary reason that God is requested to lift up his hand is to demonstrate his power and will to judge the sinners. Because sinners tend to think that God's long-suffering, his patient waiting, is a sign of either, either his absence or his powerless state. The wicked says in his heart that God will not hold him accountable for his sins. Thus he says in his heart, thou wilt not require it. This very thought discloses a whole set of his misconception of God, of man, sin, justice, and righteousness. Ironically, the wicked is thinking that God is not going to judge him over his sins. And also he's thinking that there may not be a God because he's not punished. It's an interesting idea or interesting psychology. The reason that the wicked ones are feeling that there is no God is because they are not being punished. So in other words, somehow they do recognize their wrongs, but even though they have done wrongs, there is no punishment. There is no such a thing like a divine justice or divine punishment. Therefore, it must be an evidence that there is no God. He does show evilness in his life and heart, but there is no apparent punishment. Thus, the whole ungodly world feels that there is no God. In other words, even the ungodly world takes the justice done against the sin and guilt as an evidence of the existence of God. However, God sees everything in verse 14. God cannot but see mischief or troubles and grievance and spite or sorrows of the afflicted, um, the innocent beings. The nature of God takes such cases in his own hands. It means that God is observant of the, of the afflictions of his saints and laying them up in his hand and preserving them there in order. The feeble and the helpless ones leave all their burdens to him. It is because as the scripture says, vengeance is God's. Retribution is not belong to us, but it belongs to God. The justice and judgment and punishment is not going to be our product, but it will be coming from the hands of God. How fearful that may be. Thus the poor commit themselves to the Lord in times of trials. The poor also refers to the helpless or the hapless. The ESV says the helpless. The NASB says the, the unfortunate and the NIV says the victims, they do commit everything unto God. What we need to notice here is that the notion of God in the heart of the ungodly is different from the God of the Bible. That misconception of God or different ideas of God produce the different beliefs and different convictions. Against the ungodly one's expectation, whatever they think of God, God sees all and executes his justice over them. The psalmist now pleads thirdly with the Lord not to forget the humble. 
God is the helper of the fatherless in verse 14b. God hears the desire of the humble, verse 17a. This very desire is an outcome of the Lord's work in their hearts. God prepares their hearts and he causes his own ear to hear. By thus giving ear to hear their cry, God establishes their heart, that is, gives them new courage and a brighter outlook for the future. At this point, the assurance of the psalmist truly shines forth really very clearly. He knows that God has heard his prayer as well as the cry of all those who have suffered affliction at the hands of the wicked and evil ones. God has given and preserved the two uh, preserved to their hearts the right disposition towards himself. So the righteous, the genuine children of God, are inclined to depend on him and commit unto him for everything, even in times of troubles. So surrounding circumstances may be, you know, showing us only the co collapsing uh, pictures. However, even in the midst of it, God has preserved, God has given us that right disposition to go toward him, to commit all the matters with him. God executes his justice. By executing his justice, mortal men of the earth may no longer terrify the fatherless and the oppressed in verse 18. If we put this verse you know, put all these things together with uh, Psalm 9, verses 19 and 20, it makes a huge contrast between God and the tyrant, a mortar of the earth. Mortar man from the earth, the wicked, is far removed from any possibility of a vine with, with God who is in heaven. And so the wicked one's doom is sealed. Only matters is a time when it will happen. Psalm 9 and 10 are intertwined with the same subject, which is a prayer for deliverance while oppression um, rules over the helpless. The wicked are not just because there is no God in their hearts, in their thoughts. The wicked are not just um, think that there is no God in their thoughts. They are misconceived the thoughts of God embolden them to be mischievous to their innocent victims and it shows through their ways of life, actions, deeds, and words. The helpless but godly victims arise above their pain and suffering only by looking unto God and asking him to arise on their behalf. God is the living God who hears the prayers of his people and sees the sins of the wicked. So I do not know what kind of pressures you may go through at this moment of time, what kind of burdens you are uh, living under. However, I hope that it will be a prayer that uh, you will be made in times of uh, pressures. Thus we pray to him, arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand and forget not the humble. It is my prayer that the Lord will arise himself and lift up his hands up for your prayers and your afflictions. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, there are ongoing conflicts between the godly and the ungodly. And there are ongoing uh, conflicts between faith and unbelief. Dear gracious Lord, in times of pressures, when we are living under the burdens of life, Help us to remember that um, we have a privilege to cast all our burdens onto you, Lord, through prayer. Dear God, it is our prayer. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.